So everybody, I promised you a few days ago, this would not be the last special interview here on Vale of Sound for the month of July. Today, when you're watching this, it's going to be July, let me think, uh, 24, uh, 24 or 25. Um, and actually, it's very important for me to get this clear. We're doing this on the 24th of 25th because in a few days, the man that you see on the other side of his image is going to be back in Europe. So Stephen Fontill or Steve Fontill, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. First of all, Stephen or Steve, what do you prefer? Uh, Steve. Okay. So Steve, that's, that's you, what all my friends know me by. Yeah. Oh, it's already a pleasure. Uh, Steve, uh, thanks for doing this because I know that it's very, very hectic with you back in, in Idaho at the moment. You've already said so at the beginning. When are you leaving for Europe? In about um, 14 hours. Which in Europe then will be uh, the noon of the 21st of July. So um, you see, like even shortly before he goes on tour, the man is still willing to talk to us, which is a pleasure. Uh, Stephen, if I remember correct, you're starting off in Poland this year, right? Uh, yeah, yep. And um, I've, I've also seen that you are coming very close to me. So I'll, I'll see you in Darmstadt in a few weeks, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and of course, everybody is always like anxious of, you know, what kind of material are we going to hear? Um, are we going to hear a lot of the wilderness albums or are we going to get something like the grave records or do we get some covers or of course, I mean, like, I'm not going to talk about the band itself, but I know that there will be folks out there who would love to hear you do a neurosis song. Um, are there any things that you can already disclose at the moment what you're going to do or maybe not going to do? Uh, I'll be doing this similar to what I did in the United States last year. The, the set will be primarily the No Wilderness Deep Enough record. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm most inspired by right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll play almost the entire record and uh, we'll play several songs off the previous record. Um, a life unto itself um and um just a couple older ones and that's that's it it's going to be about 80 minutes of material um and it's got a nice flow to it and with these musicians and with with the orchestration i have for this it, it makes the most sense to play no wilderness deep enough um you know and uh yeah it's going it's going to be a nice evening of sound so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last time that you were on tour in Europe was, if I remember correctly, pre-COVID, wasn't it? Yes. So how anxious are you to get back on European stages? Or maybe also how afraid are you of going back to European stages? Um, I have no fear. And I, I don't know if anxiety, it's more excitement. And um, uh, gratitude, you know, the fact that I even have an opportunity to do that. Not not many people have that opportunity to travel and, and play music, you know. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's a I, I don't do it for money or anything like that. But I mean, just for the experience, like it's the, I think about that sometimes, like how many really interesting artists are there, but just nobody cares even enough to book them a show anywhere. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's hard for people to be interested. So I feel very lucky that, uh, you know, I'm going to be able to go to 20 something uh, cities in Europe and 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 sing these songs and, and make this music with friends and, and travel with friends and and meet meet people that, uh, you know, maybe get something out of this kind of music. There will definitely be a lot of people getting something out of your music don't un i i know that you're a very humble person but you know don't don't undersell yourself that way but you already mentioned you know like going abroad um are there any particular towns that you are looking forward to for either you've been there or or you haven't been there um 
Uh, there's so many. I mean, there's there's some interesting venues in England that I'm very excited about. They all look like very nice, uh, you know, small, intimate, very uh, kind of classy buildings, older buildings. Um, the um, Tochnik Castle uh, outside of Prague in the Czech Republic. I played there some years ago in the in uh, uh, more of a basement, and I think this year it's more in a tower. Okay. So that'll be interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, just from what I've... Uh, uh, UT Konowitz in Leipzig is one of yeah. my favorite places in the entire world um, because of the people, the people that... Uh, that run it and organize the shows and, and everything are just wonderful human beings. And I, I always look forward to seeing them. Um, I, I also, I think because Connor Witz is a, is a very, for all those people who, who don't come from Germany, Connor Witz is is um, it's one of those iconic concert halls in Europe or in Germany, at least I would say. And the whole area around it has a very, very special vibe. It's a very, different kind of neighborhood it's very alternative very open um very leftist and nearly anarchist in a way uh and that, i i know that that gives the whole place a very very special vibe you've played there with with neurosis before haven't you right yeah i've done i've played there with neurosis and solo mm -hmm. material yeah yeah that's a really magical place um Although I've only been there once, but it's one of those places that sticks in your memory. What I also saw is that you are, you've already mentioned, you know, you, you're playing a castle. Um, but at the same time, you're also playing in a former church. Um, is that something that is interesting to you, you know, playing in secularized former churches or those special places in general? Absolutely. I mean, you know, rock clubs don't have a lot of, I mean, in general, there, of course, there are special rock yeah. clubs and historic yeah. and rock clubs with a lot of history, yeah. you know, um, and whatnot. But um, with, especially with this music, finding a place that has a, a, some sort of resonance of thinking about the deeper things about mm -hmm. thinking of, you know, contemplating um deeper energies um churches are places well you know i have a, a like most people probably in our um for lack of a better word scene uh, i have mixed feelings about churches in general um uh, but one thing I will give Christianity of, of after the Middle Ages is is they know how to build a they know how to build a nice building sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and um, and uh, whether we might think that uh, a lot of it has been misused or abused or misguided or what have you, it still has an energy that is maybe uh, appropriate for quiet introspection and listening. Yeah. And uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe when these spaces are sec secularized and used for the arts, uh, it's a way of reclaiming <laughs> sacred places. You know? a very interesting. For the forces thought. of good. Yeah, yeah, very interesting thought because you take you take the good thing of the architecture and combine it with something that is not, in a way, exploiting people. Uh, their pockets, uh, their minds, and all of that. Um, at the same time, I, I, I sorry for sticking around with that church a little bit, because I thought that in a way, what you are doing there on a very different level, but to a to a very similar effect, is also seeking some kind of transcendence, isn't it? That's always my goal with music wherever I am. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So would you say that you rather do a secularized mass instead of a concert? Is that what you would love to think about it? 
No, music <laughs> is my church. Oh yeah, that is that is a good way of putting it. Definitely, definitely. I, I like that one. Um, what strikes me all the time about listening to your solo stuff is the way that how should I say? On the one hand, you're using your voice for storytelling or for, for getting your philosophical and ethical ideas across. But at the same time, it is, at least to me, very often some kind of another instrument. Are you aware of the vocal qualities that you have? Uh, probably not objectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I have to deal with what my voice sounds like and its mm -hmm. limitations and it's, um, uh, you know, um, the way it changes over time and, and, uh, the struggles I have with, with my voice. Um, and, um, also just you know the usual that i think a lot of people suffer from of like just a lot of times not feeling like i have a good voice or not feeling like it's worth uh, uh putting out there in the world sometimes but luckily the you know the old punk rocker in me doesn't require things to be good in order to use self-expression and put it out there you know so um i other times, yeah. I mean, I, other times I enjoy really getting inside my voice and, and trying to find things that resonate with me and that, that feel natural and that um, where I, I, less is more. I can use my limitations to my advantage, you know, to um, try to put across some sort of uh, emotionally significant sound and words, you know. Very interesting that you mentioned the the change of your voice. Um, let me guess: there are songs from older records or from older collaborations that you are not really able to perform in a way that you think is appropriate. Um, or do you just have to change them a little bit? I just have to change a little bit. Sometimes I, I in the last couple of years, I've had a pretty significant challenges with my vocal cords and I, I've had to, uh, uh, I've struggled with my lower note, my lower couple notes, and I've had to adapt the music up a little bit. Um, and it's, um, you know, you would think all those years of screaming affected my voice but i actually my theory is that it, it's my day job of talking to nine-year-olds for eight hours a day yeah every yeah. day uh, for 180 something days a year i am talking loud yeah. all day in front of nine-year-olds and i think that's been much more uh had a much more uh negative impact on my voice than screaming or whiskey or anything else yeah. of uh for, for everybody who, who doesn't understand what Steve is talking about, I mean, like he's an elementary school teacher and I teach um, all classes from fifth to 13th grade. Um, and I know the difference between elementary school and middle or high school because I, I was fortunate enough to, to give a few classes at elementary school. And I noticed that in elementary school, the classrooms are the loud places. And when you go into the teacher's lounge room or whatever you want to call it, it's rather a quiet spot. Where I teach, it's the opposite. You know, our teacher's room where we have like 80 people, it's always loud because otherwise you don't understand anybody else. But when you go to the classroom, you know, we all know those teenagers in puberty, they tend to be very quiet. So I can totally get what Steve is, is uh, hinting at. Uh, and of course, I have to ask, you know, I'm, I'm very sure that maybe not your students, but your students' parents, they know that, that you're a musician um, on the other side of a day job. 
Uh, have you ever had any kind of reaction to that, to your music? Um, very rarely. I don't think most people have any context. They know I'm interested in music. They maybe know I play. They maybe know I travel once in a while or I'm, I'm absent a little bit, but I don't think they have any concept for the most part of what type of musical scene I come from or where my music fits in the world. You know, most of these people are mainstream music fans and I have, I, you know, I have met a few people, but very few, very few. A, a few that know my music and like it and listen to it, but not, I haven't had any like fan situations or uh, anything like that. And, it, and what I find in general is most people find it kind of exciting and uh, very, they're very supportive. They think that that's, that that's cool that somebody's interested uh, enough in the arts or music to, uh, you know, not, not give it up when you have the, mm join the real world or whatever, which I find an absurd uh, way of living. You know, you, you do all the things you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. we live sure. once. Yeah. And uh, I mean, like for, for, for everybody, I mean, like I'm also doing this outside my job and I love it. Uh, would you also say that those are two things that keep your sanity? Because that's what Veil of Sound is to me. It, it keeps my sanity. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. M music um, is probably my deepest way of connecting. Yeah, music and writing poetry are my deepest ways of connecting with my, my deepest self and my, my place in the universe. Um, but working with kids and the immediate positive feedback you get from building positive relationships with other human beings is... Um, Again, connection. For me, it's all about connection. The The music and the poetry connects me with myself and my mind and my mental health and my, uh, my philosophy and my contemplating of the bigger issues. And, uh, you know, the working with, with kids helps me connect with humanity in a positive way. Because if I only was reading, watching news or social media, I would not have a positive uh, connection with our species. Do you follow social media? Because the way that I always imagine Steve Fontill is that he is more or less absent from social media. I I I'm on all of those things because I'm promoting my music. I run I run your yeah. recordings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to promote my music, and so I I cannot. I think of it in the terms of Mike Watt from the Minutemen. You know, he said a thing a long time ago of, of you got two things. You've got the gig and you've got the flyer. Anything yeah. that's not the gig is a flyer, right? Yeah. And so I try to think of social media as a flyer. It's like it, when I was a teenager, I would go to the photocopy shop and I would make flyers with glue stick and scissors and pens. And I'd go around town and I'd hang them up to promote my band's show. That's not the reality anymore. Now the reality is I have to go to these social media platforms and do the equivalent of the flyer, mm. you know, and st to stay in contact with an audience that cares about the art is really yeah. what it's about. It's about trying to engage an audience yeah. in, a, in a new way. And I'm an old man and it's not easy for me to want to interact that way, but um, mm -hmm. I find it necessary and I, I try, I try to do it. In but, a positive but, way, I, but I try to avoid. I avoid the news feeds. I avoid the death yeah. scroll. I avoid yeah, the. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I get caught in anything, I hope it's cute animal videos, and that's about all I want out of that. Yeah, you just need to have a new animal, and then you always get that on your feet. That's what I noticed last year when we got a dock. And, you know, we had a doc for two days and what came up in my feed, it was like doc videos after doc videos, which are cute and and and, and time consuming, but cute and time consuming in a good way. Um, you've also mentioned a few minutes ago that, you know, a, a lot of or some some of your students, parents know that you're you're traveling, but you are only more or less traveling in the summer break, aren't you? 
more or less, although I've taken, uh, I mean, at different times, it's been different. Uh, I, I usually take, I go, I miss up to one to two weeks of, of school a year, but usually in small chunks, you know, if I know there's a four day weekend or a three day weekend with a holiday, I will take one or one or two more days off. And that's how I've toured Japan or Australia. Um, and that's how, uh, I've done, you know, West coast or, or, you know, small, Mm-hmm. three or four show runs yeah. but in order in order to play enough shows to you know earn the plane ticket money money home in europe you know yeah. you got to go for several weeks so yeah. to go to europe it usually requires a few weeks but also i mean i've i've flown to roadburn on a thursday flown home on a sunday and been back to work monday morning so you know it just depends yeah yeah i i know that but i I also think that you know it makes more sense for you, with your whole entourage, with with your band going to Europe. It, it just makes more sense to to take a few weeks in the summer. Um, let's come to um, the record that you've already mentioned. No wilderness di- uh, deep enough. Um, what strikes me about it is that in some ways it is, it is what you expected. You know, it's your voice. It's um, in some ways based on on folk and some version of country however we want to call it um and on the other hand there are songs on this record and also on the one that followed sorry which are nearly ambient in a way is that something that you know very early on okay this is more of an acoustic track and this is more of some electrified ambient or other track well no will i spoke a lot about it when it came out and is so i don't want to be it to people that have already heard about it too much but that's why i only take uh, one answer <laughs> or one no will no wilderness deep enough I don't think there's anything folk related in it at all. There's not a guitar on the entire record. Um, and I don't believe there's any country. No, 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 no. You... Yeah, there's, yeah. there's cool. uh, honestly th- this, that record I wrote the basis of it in Germany, uh, on a small little keyboard when I couldn't sleep uh, in my wife's parents' house, they've been on the same house site. Uh, outside of Bremen for over 500 years in one place, one spot. And one family, you know, Europe is older than America as far as, well, not if you're Native American. Europe is older for us of European descent um, than uh, uh, modern America. But but even in German standards, for one family to be in one place for 500 years is a long time. And so there's a weight, there's a weight on that property. There's a, an ancestral heaviness. And I think because I wasn't sleeping for days, I, I tuned into this really beautiful melancholy atmosphere. I didn't think I was writing music. I just, you know, what do you do when you can't sleep? You read a book, you turn on the TV, or in my case, I was just, trying to teach myself how to use some recording software. And um, I accidentally wrote all of these very simple two, three chord melodies. Mm -hmm. Didn't think anything of it. Came back here into this room, into this studio. And I, a few months after I, I opened the files and I thought it was interesting. And I started adding some analog synthesizers and I started treating uh, some of the atmospheres and it was largely based on on three things it was based on uh mellotron strings piano and french horn and um then when all the synthesizer layers kind of came i i thought oh this is interesting i think i accidentally wrote an kind of ambient record with a little bit of neoclassical yeah i mean i'm not a, i'm not a musician on that level so i i but but I listen to a lot of minimalist composers like mm-hmm. the Icelandic people, like Olafur Arnolds or Johan Johansson or um, 
and um of course brian eno and ambient music is something i've i've listened to my entire adult life i think all of that just kind of those influences showed themselves on top of these simple melodies and when i i i thought hmm i think this is i never felt like i was writing i never felt like i was composing i never felt like i was working i was only paying attention and going with the flow it was mm. just like fun uh and i contacted my friend randall who recorded my previous record and i said hey i, I want to book some studio time with you and replace my electronic piano with a real piano and i want to uh, find a cello player to add some breath to my uh, synthesizer strings and I'd, let's find a french horn player to really play the french horn parts and he went away for a couple days and thought about it and he came back and he said you're absolutely right we should do that however you should also sing on it and make it your solo next solo record mm -hmm. cuz i didn't know what i did not know what it was going to be if i was coming up with a new project name or i had no idea i just knew that the music was interesting and i wanted to finish it um and so i disagreed with him i said my voice does not need to be on this beautiful music but it was Christmas break. My wife was back in Germany with her parents. I was alone here with the dogs. So every morning when I built the fire in the, in the, in the wood stove and had my cup of coffee, I set up a microphone, not in this room here, but in the house. And uh, I had my notebook and my poems. And I, at the end of a week, I had all of the vocal melodies, all of the lyrics and everything really, again, naturally, it never felt like I was, laboring or worrying or trying mm -hmm. and uh, i called him back and i said you're right that's absolute let's do it and so that that's how that became it became it was very organic very natural it was not um something that ever felt like work and i never had any sort of i never had any preconceived idea of what any of it should be you know and in, in the end i also released the version without the voice because uh, I still really enjoy the music. I can't listen to my own music if my voice is on it. But okay, if it, but if I take my voice off and I listen to it because I didn't work on it, it or you know, I never. It feels like I can be a true listener. I I don't feel okay. like I'm listening. To, I don't feel like I'm listening to work. Mm -hmm. You know. I I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Very interesting idea. So your voice. Is the work part in that context? <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah, or, or you know, I just I, I know. What you I mean. think if anybody if anybody sits around and listens to themselves, that's weird. Horrible, you know. Horrible. I yeah. I hate to listen to the interviews to find any flaws that we have to cut out. I, I hate it. You know, not listening. I love listening to my interview partner, but when I hear myself, exactly. yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um. That is very interesting because the way that you've described it, that is the one thing that I, I, I like all your records. I love all your records, but that one really stood out because it had a certain vibrancy to it. It felt like very, very much alive in the moment, and that's what I really loved about it. And now the yeah, way that, that you, now the way different. that you describe it, makes even more sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't, you know, if I had sat down to write it, it wouldn't have come out that way. And I, uh, if I didn't have that music to react to, I wouldn't have written those vocal melodies that way. You know, those wouldn't have come, those wouldn't have come across with a, uh, the way I play guitar, yeah. you know, those needed a different, a different, more uh, ambient atmosphere to, to come out. Yeah, and what I had thought, I know that there is no guitar on the record. What I had thought initially was that it had been recorded, not recorded, um, written on the guitar. But it, yeah, it totally makes sense. One last question before we go to our infamous quickfire round, which is, is always an interesting to few people and others, maybe not. Um, you have spoken about the weight of your parents-in-law, um, for lack of a better word, property, uh, close to Bremen. For everybody who doesn't know where it is, that's northern Germany, very, very close to the coast. Um, and, you know, in, in a lot of parts of that area, you can smell 
the sea. Um, I guess I already know the answer to, to it, but I still want to ask it. Do you think that the environment in which you write and record songs is another layer that can be heard on the record? 100%. 100%. I think, uh, you know, that, that played a huge part in that record. Um, and on top of, I mean, since I began becoming a more aware person, you know, uh, as a young man, I always had a longing for a deeper connection with nature and the earth. I always felt that our disc, that the humankind's disconnect from nature and from the earth is the root of all of our problems. And that that's been a constant theme. And so when I moved, you know, almost 19 years ago, um, to this landscape here in the forest, um, mountains and lakes and uh, and I finally had a little bit of physical space to breathe I, I found it 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 definitely has an impact you know it it uh, it's allowing me to explore those ideas more completely and more as opposed to just a uh, a wish or a longing uh, it's more of an act of becoming and an act of an act of reconnecting you know and uh finding always finding deeper ways to to try to reestablish that connection despite the fact that our lifestyle no matter where you live on the modern world is uh seems hell bent on disconnecting us from the earth from each other and from our own minds mm -hmm. Just two quick questions. Uh, before you moved to Idaho, you were still living in Oakland, weren't you? I actually have never lived in Oakland. I lived um, I lived in the Bay Area my whole life. I yeah, that's what I'm sorry. I, I grew up, yeah, I grew up in San Jose. I lived in San Francisco uh, in my early 20s to late 20s. And then I moved back uh, to the South Bay hmm. uh, Yeah, for a few years. But yeah, basically my whole life was there in the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Bay Area, the whole mm -hmm. area. There. And la la last question before we come to the last part of his interview. You've said that you wrote this basically on your parents-in-law's property. Did they get any royalties? Um, when you're an artist of my size and you run your own <laughs> record label, There's no such thing as royalties. There's only a debt. Yeah, so I, I would not want to give them a share of the debt, but they definitely get my gratitude. Yeah, and they got your loyalty, and that's, I think, even more important. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, Steve, I'm very sure you don't know the ways around here on our interviews. We always end our interviews with what I like to call the infamous quickfire round. You will get a few questions where you have to answer stuff like, what do you like more, uh, Springsteen or Billy Joel or AC versus DC, um, an oak or a large, you know, whatever. Um, and you have to choose one of them and give a short explanation for your choice. Let's start off with something that is not heard on the record, but I know that you like that kind of music in general. Uh, Waylon Jennings versus Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash, mm -hmm. because I feel at the in the twilight of his life, uh, when his voice was fragile, mm -hmm. and he could have very easily retired, he made some of the most moving recordings of his entire yeah. career. Mm -hmm question attached to that. Would you agree with Trent Reznor, who once said that Hurt is not his song anymore, but now it's Johnny's? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I would say the same. You know, and it, but it's very seldom that um, a, a cover artist outperforms the original, but in that case, definitely. Okay, second yeah. question. Um, Susie Versus Blondie. Man, these are unfair. 
Um, Susie. Okay. Better fashion sense. Interesting, interesting explanation. Um, because I think that a lot of guys would, for that same reason, have chosen Debbie, Harry, well, and Blondie. But I understand what you mean. Yeah. But I understand what you mean. And she had Robert and she had Robert Smith on guitar. So yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, David Eugene Edwards or Mark Lanigan? David Eugene Edwards. Mm -hmm. Um, because, well, I would pay any amount of money to have Mark Lanigan's voice. What a voice on that guy! Yeah, an incredible. If if we're just talking about the voice, he wins, like that. Yeah, that but then he wins incredible. against everybody, doesn't he? Yeah, one of a kind, incredible voice. I mean, just incredible depth. Uh, but David Eugene Edwards has uh, recorded a couple records that have just had way higher frequency on my personal playlist. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, 16 horsepower, Secret South and um woven hands mosaic mm -hmm. uh, they both hit me at times where i really needed them mm -hmm. you know uh and got me through mark lanigan's again so say some great songs and some yeah. of my favorite records that was a really hard one and and the voice no problem but just um the actual written songs on those two records uh the merging of the Americana in that, that way um, and the instrumentation, I, I think I would just have to have to pick David Eugene Edwards. Hmm. Something that I just have to give you because you basically mentioned them. Uh, Icelandic composers, Arnold or Johansson? Johansson. Um, it's darker. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, it's more in my wheelhouse. Although I, I love I love Olaf or Arnold's too. And I actually drove to Seattle, my wife and I, six hours to see him perform one time. And I, I really got a lot out of it. it, it but it, it's, and his stuff is really beautiful. And, and he has a really unique approach with the MIDI controllers on the pianos and the using the space echoes. Um, but his music is a little more uplifting most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Whereas uh, when I first heard Johansson's Fordlandia, it really stopped me in my tracks of mm -hmm. deep emotional darkness, you know, and, and he continued to do a few other ones that just really, really get me, you know, and that's uh, the world, the world lost a special composer when he, when he died. Yeah. Definitely. Two things that um are connected or the following two, que two questions are in some ways connected to your to your connection to a country to a a little less hectic lifestyle uh, and a little bit more uh natural lifestyle what would you prefer the sowing season or the harvest season harvest every time that's mm -hmm. a from uh, October to uh, all the way through winter. I mean that 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 October October to. Uh, I just really love it. I love this. I love the seasons turning. I love the uh, even though they've been commercialized, uh, and you know sometimes it, it, there it has the wrong premise. The whole in North America in the United States the whole. Uh, Halloween to Thanksgiving, then to Yule or what they call Christmas, you know, um, that whole lead up of the of the seasonal decorations, the pumpkins, the corn, the uh, grain, the metaphor of even for us in the modern world who don't rely on on being agricultural. The metaphor of you reap what you sow, and if you did the work, now is the time to enjoy the rewards 
of your work. And I love to go outside when it gets colder. I love to be outside when it's time to walk in the forest before the snow gets too deep. Um, I love the smell of the earth as the leaves are decaying. Uh, all of it. That's, that's my favorite season. Absolutely. The harvest that that's kind of why I, I called my other project harvest man. I guess you indirectly already answered my next question, but still I want to pose it. Uh, winter versus summer. Winter. winter. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you grow anything on your own land? We don't, uh, we don't farm food mm -hmm. because, uh, I mean, um, we still have the very busy lifestyle with all of our, you know, I run the record label and the school and the music. And so I don't have the, the, the time? time and the inspiration mm -hmm. to want to, you know, we grow, we have 12 acres here and we mostly, uh, we do forage. We, you know, we let the wild plants go and yeah. we let, uh, there's many species of wild berries and we do plant perennial gardens. So we mm -hmm. plant them one year and then we just let them go forever. Uh, so, you know, we do have berries and we do have a lot of native plants with medicinal properties and you can make our own tinctures and, and uh, you know, can pull a few things here and there for salads, you know, or, uh, you know, go pick berries for breakfast in the morning and, and, uh, make interesting things, but mostly we just try to let it be and to let it go wild and to observe and to watch and enjoy, you know, we know, we know where the different flowers are going to pop up in the different seasons. And we, we know which uh, species of birds are going to come in what season. And we know, you know, when the certain animals are going to return, you know, so it's so more, it's more nature at its most natural. Yeah, if we were if we weren't careful, we'd let the, we'd let the forest like reabsorb our entire house. We, like, uh, <laughs> we, we don't want to keep a well manicured English garden. You know, we 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 uh we like it wild. Oh, you're not playing golf in the summer. What's that? <laughs> I have three more questions for you, and then I I let you go and organize everything so that I can see you in a few weeks. Brian Eno versus Philip Glass. Brian Eno. I like, mm -hmm. I love Philip Glass. And uh, when, when I was a young man, Koyana Scotsy was definitely a life changer. Um, however, just as far as pure output, I think as a influence on my music, Brian Eno's uh, ambient records, I, I'm not such, I'm not so into his regular songs. Uh, you know, I do like some of the early stuff, um, Another Green World, for example, but I really prefer the ambient stuff, the music for airports, Apollo. My favorite is On Land. Um, I believe that was Ambient 4. Um, and I also love the, uh, I do love his new record. His new record, the ambient, it's an ambient record that he sings on. That one I really, really am, have been enjoying that one. Uh, it came out what maybe six six months ago or within the last year. Yeah, just twenty twenty three. I'm very sure it is. Yeah, very. I'm really enjoying that one, and I I love what uh, the influences that he had on producing music. Uh, mm -hmm. What what he did with the U two records yeah. was really interesting, and what he. And in working with Daniel Lanois, he inspired Daniel Lanois to also really take kind of like looking at how to sonically represent music in new and interesting ways, I think was a huge influence. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the following couple, but I think both could be right up your alley. Anna von Hauswolf or the Irish modern alternative folk band called Lankum. I do know Lankum. Uh, so then? So Lankum. Cool. Um, although I've, I've heard great things about uh, Anna von Hauswolf. I just haven't, I haven't uh, got, gone down that rabbit hole yet. Mm. But uh, 
Lancome, I've actually been a fan of since they were called Lynched. That um, was, I think, five years ago or six years ago. Yeah. Or even uh, now. A friend of, one of my best friends in the world, uh, we went to high school together. He, After high school, he went uh, the typical backpacking around Europe uh, trip and got, got to Ireland and never came back. Um, and so he Not sent me... Uh, he sent me the uh, Cold Old Fire LP mm. uh, when it came out. I think it's 10 years old now. Um, but I'm very happy that we're hitting it a little bigger since the last yeah, record great. came out this year. The, yeah, the new, record, uh, the new record I like quite a bit. I liked the previous one as well. I like, I like it when young people who probably listen to a lot of the same bands I did growing up, you know, listening to a lot of punk and whatever, but also they got into traditional music and really yeah. took it under their wing, but have given it a new energy. And that's how folk music will stay relevant. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Last one. And with that one, we go back nearly 40 years in time. Um, and I don't want you to judge both bands on the last records or the last decade, but... Back in the olden days, which band would you have preferred to see perform at Gilman? Green Day or Sam I Am? Hmm. Well, I mean, I I saw them both many, many I times. And which <laughs> so. which which one did you prefer seeing live? Hmm. Probably depended on the day and how I was feeling. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and and back then everybody was just friends, and everybody saw everybody's bands and enjoyed everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. so that's really hard to pick. I guess I'll pick Green Day, mm -hmm. um, simply because uh, Billy Joe does even even when they were little and small, and you know when we were the bigger band of those, you know, he did have a some people have that front man personality or or, yeah. or not personality but the front man energy like the really like you would say that that guy's a good front man there's you know? a good german word for that rampenzau he had the rampenzau <laughs> yeah he is i mean like if you compare jason and and billy joe then yeah he he's the he's the a little bit more entertaining out of those two that's true Stephen, thanks for your time. Uh, see you in a few weeks in Darmstadt. Uh, I wish you nothing but for best for the start of a tour. I'm very, I'm very sure you will be applauded and congratulated because A, the music is cool, B, you deserve it, and C, we're all happy to have you back on European stages. For everybody else who is watching this, next week on the 27th, tour starts in, uh, what was it? Krakow, right? Krakow. Krakow. Uh, beneath this, you will find the tour poster. You can check out all the dates. Um, and if you like this little interview that we did here, just drop us a message. Give us a little feedback on our socials. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Um, if you like it a little bit more than just a little bit, maybe give us a subscription or even more. Go to our Patreon, support us a little bit. That would be awesome. Steven, for you, chance for final last words. I hope to see some of you there at the shows. You know, I'm, I'm anxious to go pack the gear right now. And uh, please come out and, and support us. You know, independent musicians need it. And I, I, I thank you for your time and thoughtful questions and, and uh, helping promote what you love about music. Uh, it's important that we uh, put positive things out there into the universe. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>